Great to be with you. My name is John, as Sarah said, and it is just my privilege, my delight, really, to be here with you. Excited to be able to share with you. Those of you here in our Cambridge location, won't you give me a shout? Well, you'll get warmed up as the morning goes on. It'll be okay. Those of you joining us online, it is great to be with you as well, wherever you're coming from. I'm really excited to be able to continue our current series. Today, we're going to be looking at the Messiah and love. Let's start. Let's pray together. Lord, I want to thank you that you're with us, Lord. I want to thank you for your word, Lord. Lord, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would speak into each and every heart, wherever they are today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I am married to uh, the lovely Hannah, and we have two kids. We have Ellen, who is four, and Ben, who is a little over one. Now, Ben is very adventurous. Quite frankly, he's always trying to do something that is a little bit dangerous. However, there is one toy where fear overtakes his bravery. That is the authentic 1990s robot dog called Dexter. And if I turn him on, you might agree, the eyes, calm down, the eyes, they are a little bit freaky, right? So he has this fear of this dog. And Ellen, like all good siblings, likes to gently terrorize him with it. (laughs) Off she goes. And Ben has got one response. How quick can I make it to mommy or daddy? Because once I've thrown myself and literally pressed myself into their arms, there in their loving embrace, everything is going to be okay. From the safe vantage point of our love, Dexter can be pointed at, he can be shouted at, just don't put me down. See, love changes things. The Beatles famously sang this, all you need is love. All you need is, that's as much singing as you're getting out of me in one service. All you need is love. But is that really true? And if it is, that faces a bigger question in our lives. Where do I find true love? And in this series, we have reached the central point, the central theme of the Bible. Each of the previous sections as we've been building along in this series have pointed to this, but now as we enter the Gospels, it's absolutely clear that love is at the center of this story. And not just any kind of love, because we can have a little bit of love confusion. And the English language doesn't really help us with that, because the same word that we go to our mom and we say, mom, I love you, we say in the next word to describe how we feel about pizza. And suddenly, mum isn't feeling quite so special. But it's a bit different in the Greek, because the Greek, which is the primary language the New Testament was written in, they have multiple words for love. And the word that's used in the Bible to describe the self-sacrificial love of Jesus that's revealed here in the Gospels is the word agape. And it's very different from my enjoyment of high-carb food. It's a self-sacrificial love. It's a giving everything love. In fact, this word agape is best defined here in the Bible itself in a passage you might be familiar with, John chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Life. For God so love, what an amazing definition of God's love for us. And today, we are going to explore the love of God through the life of Jesus, who it says here in this passage, came for us. Now, Hannah and I, we spent time agonizing over the names of our future children. If you're a parent in the room, you might be able to identify with this. For us, it went a little bit like this, right? We went through lists of names because we've got to be sure, right? We don't want to miss the perfect little name for our future little daughter. We've got to make sure we've checked them all. So check all the names. 
And then you've got to rule out, right, all those names because I knew that person at school and we are not calling our daughter that. And then you've got to make sure you haven't accidentally spelt something offensive with the initials that you've chosen. It's a stressful business. Come on, it's a stressful business choosing the name for your child. But Jesus' earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, they didn't have this stress. An angel told them what his name should be. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. You are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Behold, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, names in the Bible, they didn't just choose them because they thought they were pretty or cool. They're meaningful. They're prophetic. They were saying something about that individual. So Jesus is the one who will save. He is God with us, come to save us from our sins. Another name used for Jesus is Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. In the scriptures, kings They were anointed with oil. It was a sign of God's authority coming upon them. The Greek equivalent for the word Messiah is Christos. That's where we get our word Christ, Jesus Christ. But Christ isn't his surname. It's talking about his identity. It's saying Jesus is the anointed one. Jesus is the king. You know, in this series, we were back on week two. We were looking at beginnings. We were in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And God, right back then, is promising to restore severed relationship. He's saying, I'm going to restore it. He said, someone will come who will crush the head of the snake. Jesus is that promised snake crusher. He's come to restore his kingdom. He makes this assertion even about himself. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus speaking, he says, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So in the time that we've got together today, I want to look at three attributes of the Messiah as king. Number one, the Messiah is the good king. Why is Jesus as king such good news? Well, Jesus is the rightful king who brings God's love so that the world can flourish again. Last week we were talking about exile. In one sense, we've all exiled, we're all lost in our selfish choices, but through Jesus, we can have a chance of hope, we can have a chance of a fresh start, we can have a chance to live because of God's grace that comes into our life. And as we track through the Gospels, these are the first four books of the New Testament, we see Jesus... And we see him showing up in places and talking to people that we might not expect. And his disciples, they're confused. They're like, Jesus, why are you talking to that person? They're like, Jesus, why this individual and not that crowd? Jesus, why are we going to talk to those people? Because we don't even like those people. But Jesus wants you and me to be absolutely clear. His love is for everyone. I want you to hear this this morning. Wherever you are in the sound of my voice, Jesus' love is for everyone. You are not outside of the love of Jesus. Your past has not disqualified you. You are not outside of being able to experience the transforming love of a Savior because Jesus' love is for you. And as we track through the Gospels, we start to see Jesus showing up in the lives of people. And seeing how his perfect love has the power to transform their lives. We meet this lady called Mary Magdalene. We're not quite certain on her past, but we know it's been somewhat troubled. It says in Luke chapter 7 that Jesus sets her free from seven demons. That's big transformation. And she journeys with Jesus. And she goes around with the disciples. She's at the cross as Jesus is crucified. She's one of the first witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. Here is a woman who's been given little or no value in her culture. But Jesus says, I see it differently. He says, you might not be trusted to give a testimony in court, but I have chosen you and I have trusted you to bear witness to the most important event in the whole history of humanity. You see, the love of the good king changes everything. 
The love of the good king has the power to transform lives. We meet this guy called Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a tax collector. He's a collaborator with Rome. In that sense, he's a traitor even to his own people. And the Bible paints this picture of Zacchaeus. This is a selfish guy. A guy living for himself and what he can get out of life. But there's something that's deep within him which says, I need to see Jesus. And Zacchaeus has a problem which I don't struggle with. It says in the Bible that Zacchaeus was a very short man. So he needs to climb a tree. So he goes and he climbs up this tree just so that he can see Jesus over the crowd. And Jesus is walking along and he gets to the tree where Zacchaeus is and he stops and he looks up and he says, Zacchaeus, I want to come to your house for dinner. Now to understand what's being said there, you need to understand that in that culture, eating together, dinner was more than just sitting down for some food. It was a sign of relationship. It was a sign of acceptance. It was a sign of being invited to come together. And one meal with Jesus changes everything for Zacchaeus. One meal with the king, one meal with God's transforming love changes everything. There's this beautiful picture that goes on of God's kingdom coming to earth. Because what happens is Zacchaeus has been stealing from people. He's been taking from them. But when he meets Jesus and he experiences Jesus' transformative love, he says, Hey, Jesus, I see it now. And I'm going to repay those people four times over because that is the power of the restorative love, the power that Jesus has to restore the world to restore lives, to restore his kingdom. And I want you to know that Jesus' love still has the power to transform lives. Right now, today, Jesus' love is still powerful to transform lives. You know, my story is not quite so dramatic. In many ways, I've been really blessed. I had a good family, a happy childhood, but I came to this place in my life On the outside, everything was good. But inside, everything was broken. Anxiety and emptiness was what ruled my life until I surrendered my life to Jesus. And let me tell you, the transforming love of Jesus changes everything. I can't promise you're going to have an easy life. That's not the promise of Jesus' love, but I can tell you, meeting with your Savior and experiencing his love changes everything. And you might be listening today and you might resonate with one of those stories. I want you to know this with a surety. No matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, Jesus' love has the power to change your life. Jesus' love has the power to change everything. Jesus' love is transformational. That is good news. Come on, friends. That is good news for me and you this morning. The Messiah is the good King, and you might be listening, you might think, hey, John, I hear what you're saying. I I can hear you loud and clear. You're claiming that God loves me, but how can I be so sure? Well, Jesus demonstrates it. Because the Messiah is the good king, but he is also the crucified king. It's really surprising how we've come to see the cross. When I first met my lovely wife, Hannah, She'd often wear a simple necklace like this, simple cross pendant, which is strange when we actually think about it. Why would we wear a symbol of torture and execution? I mean, on the face of it, we probably wouldn't go around today wearing a pendant of a lethal injection or an electric chair. We just wouldn't do it. So how then have we come to see the cross the way we see it? How has the cross become synonymous with this idea of love? Well, as we trace through these Gospels, each of them, they zoom in and give extra time, extra focus to the last week of Jesus' life in Jerusalem. See, the religious leaders have become jealous of his popularity and their plot to kill Jesus until we eventually find ourselves here in John chapter 19. Verse 17, it says, They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to a place called the place of the skull, which is, in Hebrew, Golgotha. So we find Jesus, the one who saves Christ, the anointed one, God incarnate, 
struggling within an inch of his life under the weight of two pieces of wood that will eventually steal his final breath. And we wonder to ourselves, how did we end up here? How has the story reached this point? It's all part of God's plan. See, Jesus willingly went to the cross. You know, the disciples, they were confused. They were lost in their perception of the Messiah and how he was going to restore his kingdom. You see, they saw force. They saw power. They saw armies. They saw conquest. But Jesus said, no. Transforming my kingdom, restoring my kingdom requires something very different. It requires my surrender. You know, we've all done wrong things. Wrong things towards others. Wrong things towards God. Hey, even wrong things towards ourselves. And the Bible says that we get lost under the weight of those wrong things. But Jesus in the cross is Jesus standing in the place where we should have stood. Taking our sin and our shame. He says, I willingly take it upon myself for your freedom. See, this wasn't just another Roman execution. This is the love of the Savior outworked for all humanity. This wasn't just another upstart against the empire crushed. Suddenly we see the cross in a different light, not just as a blunt instrument of torture, but as the love of the Messiah outworked for all humanity. Oh, I can trust that God loves me because he demonstrated that he loves me in the sacrifice that he made. It goes on in John chapter 19, where we were a little bit later to say this. When he had received drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed up his head and he gave up his spirit. To the Romans, it was finished. Another upstart against the, conquer, against the empire crushed. To the religious leaders, it was done. That was the end of that problematic teaching. But to Jesus, this was a very different statement. This is a proclamation of truth. That sin and death and the grave would be forever conquered. But let me tell you, if Jesus stays in the grave, we remain without hope. If Jesus stays in the grave, we're hopeless today. But while darkness marked Good Friday, light is coming on Easter Sunday. Hope is about to break out. The grave cannot hold him. It says that the death could not hold him. The grave could not hold him. That He rose again. He died in our place carrying our sin and our shame, but he rose again. I love the way it says it in Luke's gospel. It says the woman took the spices they had prepared. And they went to the tomb, but they found that the stone rolled away. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down their faces to the ground. But the men said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. He is not here, he is risen. He is not here, he is risen. Jesus is risen. He is the risen king. That's my final point. Jesus is the crucified king, but he is the risen king. You know, Jesus, after his resurrection, he appears to many. And that wasn't Jesus as a ghost. That wasn't Jesus having had a near-death experience and come back to life. This is death to life. That's why we can hold hope for eternity too. And he commissions his disciples and he ascends to heaven and says that Jesus is seated in heaven and he's, he's praying on our behalf. How amazing is that? The Savior is praying, interceding on our behalf today. And one day he is going to come again. He is going to fully restore his kingdom. The work that started will be completed. You know, Jesus' commission to his disciples is really important because in it, we get this glimpse of what is the right response as those who have received the love of Jesus in our lives. 
You know, in John chapter one, Jesus is described as the light that the darkness cannot overcome. You skip across to Matthew chapter five and Jesus conveys that onto his disciples because he says this, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine among others. Hey, C3 Church this morning. In the same way, let your light shine among others. I know the world might seem like a dark place. I know you might go into your school today and it feels dark. You might go into your workplace in conversations with your colleagues and it feels dark. It might be that you go into your family and the conversations there and it feels like there's a darkness. But I came to tell you that if you've experienced the love of Jesus, there is a light inside of you which the darkness cannot overcome. There is a light within you that the darkness cannot overcome. And we are called to shine a light, to bring God's light into our world, into our schools, into our workplaces. If we've experienced God's love, we're called to reflect it to our world, to tell the world that this isn't the end, this isn't empty, this isn't broken. There is hope, there is a future. I'm finished. But I have one question for you. In this story, as we've unpacked it, it's revealed through the Gospels of God's love and His desire to have a relationship with you. Where are you? Where are you? You know, one of the people that Jesus appeared to after His resurrection was a guy called Thomas. Thomas was struggling to find that, how could this be true? Is this true that Jesus has risen again? I'm not so sure. And Jesus comes into the room. He says, hey, Thomas, it's okay. When you look at my hands, feel my hands, where the nails went. Thomas, why don't you reach out and touch my side? that was pierced. Thomas, stop doubting and believe. I don't believe they were harsh, angry words that came out of Jesus' mouth. I believe they were words full of love and compassion. Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Words of an invitation. Thomas, stop doubting and believe. And I believe for some of you, God's touched something deep within your life. And He's saying the same thing to you today. Stop doubting and believe. It's an invitation. What about that question I asked at the beginning? Is love all you need? I say yes. Yes, but only if we allow that word to not be defined as the chasing after some romantic feelings. Not as the number of likes that we got next to our posts, not as the words that somebody said to us or didn't say to us growing up, not as the position that we've gained, but as simply as the life, as the person of Jesus Christ. Because I believe in that sense, connecting with the love of your Savior is all you need. And you've got an invitation today. Thomas, stop doubting and believe. An invitation to step into that relationship of love. An invitation to experience a life that is changed, that is different, to experience a fresh start. You know, maybe like my little boy, you've been running from the fear that's been chasing you. And you've been running in lots of different places trying to find a place of peace and the places that you've run to haven't brought any peace, they've just brought more pain into your life because peace isn't found in a place. Peace is found in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. He is the Prince of Peace. And so the places haven't worked because peace isn't found in that place, but it is found in a person and there's this invitation to step into a relationship with Him today. This is a holy moment, church. I'm gonna invite you to bow your heads, close your eyes, 
I'm gonna pray a prayer, it's a simple prayer. It's a prayer that says, Jesus, I sense your invitation to walk in your relationship of love, to have a fresh start, to find hope, to find a new way of living. Lord, I wanna find you. Why don't you pray this with me, church? Lord Jesus, thank you for your love for me. I give you my life. Forgive me for the things I've done that have separated me from you. Thank you for new life, a fresh start. I wanna live in the relationship of your love. Maybe you prayed that prayer as a way of recommitting your life to Jesus. Maybe you prayed it as a way of coming to Jesus and accepting that invite for the first time. You don't fully understand all what is yet to come, but you sense the invitation and you wanna grab hold of his hand. If that's you today, I'm gonna invite you to make a simple step of faith, the same sort of step that Thomas was invited to do, a step of faith. And for you, that step of faith today is to raise your hand and say, yes, Jesus, I wanna know your love. I'm praying that that's me coming to you. Thank you. Lord, I wanna thank you for each and every person here today. I wanna thank you for your love. Lord, I pray for those who need your peace, Lord. I pray that you'd flood every part of their world, every part of their mind, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would all go out knowing that your love changes everything. And that there's something within us that we are called to reflect to our world. We are not without purpose, but we're called to tell the world that there is a light, that there is a savior. There is a hope and there is a God and Jesus Christ is his name. If you enjoyed this video today, why don't you click subscribe and click on that notification bell to get a notification the next time we upload a video. And if you're new or you've been coming to the C3 Church for a little while now, why don't you find out what your next step might be in the journey of faith? Click on the next step link in the description below to find out what your next step in your journey might be.